this photo this photo right here perfectly represents Ireland's journey in the World Cup the subject of the photo is Ireland's captain Katie McCabe under her leadership and the work of coach Mira Paul the team would make it to their first World Cup although they would be knocked out despite their efforts only falling short they did make history as the 2023 World Cup was Ireland's women's team's first appearance. In addition to that, Katie McCabe would score Ireland's first goal in the Women's World Cup. She would later go on to be nominated for the Ballon d'Or, the first player to do so in almost 20 years since Roy Keane. The build-up to the World Cup did have some controversy, as Ireland were led by manager Vera Paul. Previously, Paul had faced accusations of abuse. If you would like to know more about the accusations, I would highly recommend these articles by the New York Times, The Athletic, um, and I'll also put some other sources down in the description. To summarize the accusations, multiple players from the Houston Dash accuse Paul of being aggressive, micromanaging, and also abusive in her language and behavior towards players. This included micromanaging their food, their diet, their weight, and also other aspects such as being intimidating, getting aggressive on at least two different occasions, and much more. As a result, she is no longer allowed to coach in the NWSL, which is the American League, um, which I think says a lot about a coach. And a very interesting quote, actually, from the Athletic article is that some of the players who didn't even participate in the investigation said, I don't think the investigation came close to telling the full story. It makes you wonder how much confidence the women's team for Ireland had in Vera Paul. This question would be something that would come up later on. But first, I want to focus on the growth of Ireland's women's team in football. To do that, we have to take a look back in time. We didn't play on great pitches. We had to give tracksuits back. We had to change in airports. Um, it was really, really uh, below par in, in terms of um, what we could access and what we what we had in terms of being able to perform. There's been such um, yeah crazy moments with me and Emma through through the years, and in terms of even her, like when I came into the Ireland team, her having the captaincy at the time, and me wanting to be like Emma um, and then obviously when Emma had retired I had then been asked to be the next captain of Ireland and I kind of rang Emma being like what do I do I'm, I'm 21. <laughs> there was very difficult things happening at the time with the association and the women's team that was off the back of the strike which Emma had kind of took charge of so I was kind of dealing with the, the knock-on effects of that. You're hearing then the stories of what the girls had to kind of go through in terms of girls were working nine to five and had like loss of earnings because they had to take 10 days every six weeks off work to represent their country. The team would receive a hero's welcome upon their arrival in Australia as they had made history with the hopes of a nation on their back. There were emotional scenes as the Irish team arrived at Sydney Airport today on the eve of their historic match against Australia. Vera's Green Army, fans who've travelled from all over Ireland, greeted the players, their heroes. In the send-off press conference for the girls, McCabe looked frustrated as she sat through an entire press conference where she was subjected to having to listen to question after question after question in the Vera Paul discussing the abuse accusations. In fact, she made a remark which went viral. It's been a pleasure talking about the World Cup, guys. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. I want to highlight the different matches and the performances by Ireland in the three matches that they played in the World Cup. The first match seemed to draw the attention of the wider women's football community, not just Australians or Irish fans. And this has to do with the dynamic that happens off the field between certain players. Continuing with the theme of telling a story with pictures, this moment right here, Rusha Littlejohn and Katie McCabe. 
this photo would go viral. You see, Katie McCabe and Rosie Lillichon had been dating for seven years, but there were rumors that they had split. Now, personally, I don't want to dwell on this topic too much because it it's about people's personal lives, and I don't really want to do that out of respect for their privacy. But I will summarize the situation because it became the biggest headline for the game. Now, this photo was taken during the game, but before the game even started, there was another moment that caught people in the eyes. You see, when the players were lining up and shaking each other's hands, people noticed Rush Little John didn't shake Caitlyn Ford's hand. Now, for those of you who don't know who Ford is, she is one of the previous players, who also so happens to be an Arsenal player, meaning she is one of Katie McCabe's teammates. Now, as I'd stated previously, just before the World Cup, there were rumors that they had split. Now, this moment led to a lot of people theorizing that maybe Katie had split with Rusha to get with Ford. The relationship has since been confirmed that Katie McCabe and Caitlin Ford are in fact partners. But at the time, this wasn't well known and widely known by the football community. And so as a result, people ran with this. And then that photo that I showed you, that just blew the whole thing out of the water. Because people had noticed that McCabe and Rouge Little John were distant. And this was odd. People saw them as one of the power couples of women's football. And to see them not interact on the field, off the field, was something quite noteworthy. Now, some people do claim that Rusha Little John got a yellow card at the end of the game for a little spat she got in with Ford. I'm not sure about that, but what I do know is that this whole thing was an interesting way to start off the World Cup. Starting off with a bang, to say the least. Now, moving on from the personal life stuff, because to be quite frank, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about football. There were also some pretty memorable moments on the pitch, and again, captured by these amazing photos. It was just an intense match, to say the least. Um, the girls in green fought the hardest, but they would unfortunately lose to Australia. But there were some really interesting moments between McCabe and Haley Rasso. Now, the next match would be played against Canada. Canada were ranked as one of the best teams in the entire world for women's football. And so, with that, Ireland knew that it would be an uphill battle if they wanted to win. But Katie McCabe did something spectacular, which got all of us thinking, wow, that has to be one of the best goals in the World Cup so far, maybe even in the whole tournament. And that would later be backed up by the fact that it was in fact nominated as one of the best goals of the World Cup. But again, going back to what actually happened. In the early minutes of the first half, McCabe would step up to take a corner. Whether or not it was intentional, she would score from this corner, giving Ireland a 1-0 lead over Canada. Despite this lead, Ireland will fall short after they conceded two goals, meaning that they were knocked out of the World Cup. And that's how we get back to this moment. A tearful McCabe doing a lap of honor thanking the crowd. Personally speaking, as someone who's Irish and has watched Irish football for years, I don't think anyone expected us to win the World Cup, but in that moment, that moment where McCabe scored the goal, she made his dream, even if it wasn't necessarily to win the World Cup, she had the hopes of a nation on her back. And. I'm sure that moment will live in the minds of the young ones for years to come. But here's the thing, they still had one more match to play. Ireland versus Nigeria. The goal of the women's team was to go out still fighting. Just because they were knocked out of the tournament didn't mean that they couldn't cause an upset or that they couldn't put on a show for the crowd. Another iconic moment would happen this time courtesy of the goalkeeper, Courtney Brosnan. She made one of the best saves I've ever seen an Irish player make, and 
I'm honestly glad to see a goalkeeper getting credit. Now, for some reason some people underestimated the Nigerian players. I don't know what on earth those people were thinking, but in my opinion, Nigeria is an amazing team. So to see Ireland hold their own against them, fair play to the ladies. So, what now? The girls came back. They were greeted by 8,000 on O'Connell Street during the homecoming event. I was personally there. I'll insert some clips throughout the video, but it was amazing to see so many people come out and support the women's team. Personally, I've never seen anything like it. Yes, we didn't win anything, but it was nice to see them getting some recognition. The mood was jovial and celebratory. McCabe made some jokes and thanked the fans and we got to see some more of the players' personalities as they spoke. But the one thing that stuck out to me the most was the reaction of the kids. As the players looked out and saw a sea of people, they saw the next generation of Irish football. I can't imagine what that must have felt like. They would see this generation again at their first game in the Aviva. The great debut of the women's team in the Nations League. Now, in the press conference before the League of Nations match against Northern Ireland, the players' mood couldn't be more different. McCabe was joking around, she was happy, in fact she did apologise for being cracking the French press conference. Thanks. Do you know what? I was lovely chatting about football. <laughs> Sorry for being cranky in the uh, French press conference. <laughs> the most interesting moment from the press conference and the questions towards the players actually came from Diane Caldwell when she was asked about the difference between Vera Paw and the players. She said this. I think there were many areas that could have been better, yes, under her tenure. It's the same performance factors that I just mentioned. I think our preparation for games could have been better. Um, physical preparation, uh, opponent analysis, um, match tactics, um, in-game match tactics, changes, uh, systems of play. Um, yeah. What was happening under Verif? Um, I think a group of players that were destined for success came together at the right time. Well, you'd have to ask her that, but from my position as a pretty experienced player, I don't think it was up to the standard I expected at an international level. And I think the results and performances that we got were in spite of Vera being our coach. Did I ever get very good to talk to Vera about that? If you're coached by another way, yeah, we approached her many times um, about professionalising many aspects, um, but it was it was hard to get change. And you know, she obviously made myself a part of the leadership group that she created, along with a few other players. So she gave us that position to use our voice and, and to try to uh, talk on behalf of the team. And I think we tried to do that as a group the best that we could, but. Obviously, at the end of the day, she is the coach and she controls everything and you only can say and try to change so much. Yeah, I was there after the game there. It was stated that she lost the dressing room, really. Um, what do you think that was, maybe those examples that you gave that maybe not to, maybe their voice were not heard at times? Yeah, um, again, I think it was just uh, an accumulation of everything and over a long time, you know, after... The European campaign, myself and Katie also reflected um, through doctor at the time about certain aspects of things that need to be improved and changed, um, but ultimately that fell on deaf ears and she got a contract extension. Is it safe to say you're happy that there's change? Yeah, I'm very happy that there's change. Um, it gives us all kind of a new lease of life, um, there's a new beginning. And like I said, with the, the changes that the FAI has made with the new roles, it just shows intent, standards are going to be raised. Uh, they've, they've listened to the stakeholders involved in this team 
and realise that these girls are good, but we actually can be even getting more out of them, and we, they can even be performing at a higher level and achieving more success than, than what they have been. Yeah, it, it brings a kind of um, its own pressure, though, doesn't it, as well? Yeah. In the sense that you guys now kind of... Um... Saturday, the 23rd of September, the women's team would face the Northern Irish team. Republic of Ireland versus Northern Ireland. And this match was special for a plethora of reasons. The match set a record with almost 36,000 people coming to see the Irish women's team play in the Aviva. This had never been done before. In addition to that, the Aviva has been a stadium where people gather to watch the Irish men's team for football or for rugby, but we'd never seen a crowd gather like this to support a women's team and I don't think it was lost on anyone who was a young adult or slightly older that we didn't grow up with the chance to watch the women's team like this so to see the young fans crowding the stadium chanting for Abby Larkin, Jamie Finn, Katie McCabe it was truly something to experience and I'm sure that the players will agree with that the Republic of Ireland earned a nice lead with a goal scored by Lucy Quinn goals would also be scored by Ag and Carusa. Now I do want to highlight the performances of Denise O'Sullivan, Carusa, Courtney Brosnan and Larka, as well as Caitlin Hayes and Tyler Toland. These players were crucial in the passing game as well as scoring goals or helping establish passes that would lead to set goals. And the captain, Katie McCabe, what about her? Every time she touched the ball, you could feel the atmosphere shift. The crowd absolutely adored her. Earlier I said that Ireland's journey in the World Cup could best be represented by that photo of a heartbroken McCabe. The future of Ireland's women's team can best be represented by these two photos. The first one is a young Abby Larkin with her idol Katie McCabe. The second one is an 18 year old Abby Larkin with her teammate Katie McCabe. piece for the Players' Tribune, McCabe said, Whenever young players come into the team now and receive their paychecks, we tell them about how their predecessors put their necks on the line for this. Now it's up to us to continue the journey. We want this World Cup to inspire the next generation of Irish girls. We want to give people moments and memories that they will never forget. That's what we're fighting for. That's what I will be thinking about before the game. Back home in Ireland, I know that lots of little girls will be watching us, just like I was watching Emma Byrne, and I'm just hoping, with all my heart, that some of them will be sitting there thinking, one day, I'm gonna do that. And if that happens, we've already won. I have two daughters, I coach my twin daughters in football. They don't want Marcus Rashford on their back anymore. They don't want... Nobody would want him on their back, probably. Rashford. But they do. They want McCabe, Quinn, Brosnan. This is what they want on their shirts now. This is such an important moment in football. You, you guys must understand that. That you are actual trailblazers for an entire generation of footballers. Always have wanted to inspire the next generation, whether that's given time when they come see us in Tallis Stadium, stop for selfies, whatever it may be. And of course, we created history for the first time ever, reaching our first ever major tournament. But what was important for us as a team was to leave a legacy um, and have something for young girls to look up to.